we have about uh, 25 minutes no 20 25 minutes thank you very much jordi uh very impressed to see such a full room people coming from uh, all over the world uh, so in the next uh, 25 minutes or so i i'll try to address uh, different issues which I think are important to understand uh, the, the way to optimize uh, ventilatory settings. And you know that uh, in uh, critical care in general, the field of mechanical ventilation is the one for which we have shown the strongest association between ventilatory settings and outcome of the patients. So the more data we have, the more evidence we have that uh, the, there is a, a, a critical importance of correctly setting the ventilator. First issue, uh, and I'd like to discuss briefly 10 issues, I, I'm not sure you will remember them all, but uh, is that you have to be very, very familiar between time and volume. When you deal on, uh, with ventilator settings, you deal with time and volume, and the relationship between volume and time is called flow. So the ventilator needs to know which flow he has to use to deliver a given tidal volume. That's why you cannot set the ventilator with only tidal volume and respiratory rate. You have also to tell the ventilator how long should be the insufflation to deliver the tidal volume. This is the insufflation time, which sometimes is different from the inspiration time, which adds the pause to the insufflation. And a first source of confusion when you have different ventilators in your unit is that for, let's say, volume control ventilation, uh, you have two ways of setting this flow. One way is to just tell the ventilator about timing and uh, for instance the classical way is the I to E ratio and there are many ventilators which by default work with I to E ratio so the ventilator knows the total breathing time you tell the ventilator the I to E ratio, he calculates the inspiratory time, and from the volume and the inspiratory time, he knows which flow he has to deliver. But on other ventilators, you directly dial the flow. Uh, and then there is a so another source of confusion, because if you follow me, you understand that flow is volume divided by time, so it's, uh, for instance, something like half a liter, 500 milliliter, delivered in something about one second. So it would be very logical to set the flow in liter per second. Unfortunately, on every ventilator, the unit is not liter per second, it's liter per minute which uh, is very complicated to reconcile because uh, instead of, for instance, one liter per second, you have to set 60 liter per minute. And the second source of confusion is that you do not set directly the mean inspiratory flow, which is volume divided by time, but usually the peak flow. So when it's a square flow, the peak flow and the mean flow is the same. But for all other flow shape curves, like a decelerating, the peak flow is higher than the mean flow. So it's uh, another source of confusion. And the fact that the peak flow is in liter per minute is also a source of confusion because you can mix up with minute ventilation, which is in liter per minute. So this is it, there is no convention, uh, we, we cannot do better, you, you just have to know that. And you will see, for instance, that the setting of the flow is critical for, for some modes of ventilation. And if you use the I to E ratio, 
you can inadvertently set very uh, uh, inadequate uh, peak flow, for instance. So when you set the time, the I2E or, or the inspiratory time, please look on the ventilator at the peak flow resulting from your setting. Second point, to correctly set a ventilator, you need to have an idea of what explains the pressure in the system. And what explains this pressure is called the equation of motion of the respiratory system, which tells the uh, uh, tells us that uh, you have two main forces explaining that the pressure goes up when you push volume into the respiratory system. One force is resistance. It's a dynamic force. It's resistance to flow. And one force is elastance or compliance. It's a static force. It's the also called the recoil pressure of the lung or of the chest. And there is an, a third pressure which adds on the two other, which is the level of PEEP from which you start. And the difficulty is when it's not a, a set PEEP, but it's a hidden PEEP or intrinsic PEEP. So one very uh, important application of this equation of motion is the plateau pressure. You know that plateau pressure became one of the most important monitoring tool during mechanical ventilation of ARDS, for instance. And this plateau pressure is uh, directly explained by the equation of motion. When you use flow controlled, volume controlled ventilation, the pressure goes up to a peak pressure. And if you do a pause at N insufflation, so you keep the volume in the system, but you don't allow expiration, you see that the pressure drops from the peak pressure to a so-called plateau pressure. And the explanation for this uh, uh, interesting shape of the pressure is given by this equation of motion. We are not going to go into details, but this equation, as I told you, say the airway pressure. In fact, when we speak about pressure, it's a way to discuss about forces, okay? The airway pressure is the sum of the initial pressure the PEEP, for instance, plus one component due to the resistive forces, and this component can be written as resistance times flow, plus a component due to the elastic forces, the recoil pressure, which can be written as elastance times volume. Uh, when we do the pose at N inspiration, in fact, we just simply suppress one of the components. We keep the same volume, but because we stop flow, we have no more resistive pressure. So what you see on the screen of the ventilator, and which is extremely important for you to correctly set the, uh, the volume and flow, is the distinction between the resistive pressure and the elastic pressure. The elastic pressure is what is distending the system. The resistive pressure is the pressure which was needed to go from the airway opening to the distal bronchi and alveoli. And for instance, you discussed previously of patients with asthma, Patient with asthma would have a very high resistive pressure. By contrast, patients with ARDS would have a very high elastic pressure. So from this equation of motion, and that the third idea, you can, for instance, calculate resistance and compliance. Resistance is calculated by the difference between the peak pressure and the plateau divided by the flow 
the mean inspiratory flow, and the compliance is uh, calculated as the volume you have put in the system divided by the elastic pressure, which is the plateau minus the PIP. If you don't remember, modern ventilators do this calculation for you. And usually it's, uh, it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> one difficulty for the ventilator is the third component, which is the intrinsic PIP, and which can mislead the calculations. What you, th you need to understand about resistance is that resistance is uh, the way we measure it. In fact, we, don't, we do not measure it. We make a calculation. We look at the delta pressure, for instance, the peak minus the plateau, and we divide by flow. This is really a very uh, um, poor estimate of the resistance. And uh, when we look at the, com the behavior of the resistance during mechanical ventilation, we see, in fact, that the relationship between pressure and flow is not linear. It's, it's very often something like that. Uh, and this is due to the fact that uh, if you increase flow for a given uh, tube, li like airways, for instance, uh, you go from uh, a laminar flow to a more and more turbulent flow. Therefore, the dissipation of pressure becomes higher and higher. And that's why in asthmatic patients with very narrow uh, airways, uh, the flow is very turbulent and you have a very high resistive pressure. Th this is just an example to see, for instance, uh, the pressure-flow relationship in endotracheal tubes. In all endotracheal tubes, it's, it's non-linear. It's like that. But what is the most important about resistance? It's, it's to understand that this pressure which is generated is what, what we, we call dissipated against the airway. In other terms, this is a pressure needed to get the volume going from the outside to the inside. But inside, at the alveolar level, all this resistive pressure have disappeared. This resistive pressure will never harm the alveoli. And this is why in asthmatic patients, again, you can accept very high peak pressure if you sh you're sure that your plateau pressure, which is in fact your alveolar pressure, is, is low. And that's the big, uh, the, the, the very important uh, um, discovery of this simple pulmonary function test, is that when you do a plateau pressure, what you look at is the alveolar pressure which is the pressure which matters for ventilator-induced lung injury, for cardiovascular effect of mechanical ventilation, for risk of barotrauma, etc. So if you really want to correctly set the ventilator, you have to uh, correctly interpret this, this, uh, this airway pressure. This, unfortunately, is true only during fully passive mechanical ventilation. So four, we spoke about inspiration. What about the expiratory part? The expiratory part is, we, we call it passive, which means that uh, you, don't, you don't set anything on the ventilator to change the expiration. It's just the recoil pressure of the system which create expiration. And as you know, one uh, possible problem with expiration is a, a an expiration which is too short, creating intrinsic PIP, and there are two main causes that you need to know. One is the relationship between expiratory time and the time constant of the respiratory system. And the other is the issue of flow limitation. Just... Uh, 
think again uh, at this issue of resistance. A resistance creates a pressure gradient. Okay, we saw that during inspiration, because you have resistance to flow, the pressure at the entry, the one you measure on the ventilator, is always higher than the pressure in the alveoli. It becomes equal only when you have zero flow. Just now make the opposite thinking, expiration. Expiration, the gradient is in the opposite di direction. So the pressure you see on the ventilator here is always lower than the alveolar pressure. Okay, so at inspiration, the pressure you see is higher than the alveolar pressure. At expiration, it's the opposite. And again, at expiration, they become similar only when there is no flow. So the respiratory system can be, in a simplistic manner, ca characterized by its mechanical constant, the resistance and the compliance. And with such a system, we know that the expiration is a mono-exponential curve which is characterized by a time constant. This time constant depends on resistance and compliance. We have no time to go into details, but uh, at the bedside you can make the calculation if you use the correct units, multiply resistance and compliance, you will get seconds. And uh, we know that, for instance, we need at least three time constant to expire more than 95% of the inspired volume. So for any patient, if the expiratory time is shorter than three time constant, you will create intrinsic PEEP. And this is a classical slide of patients with ARDS. Patients with ARDS are supposed to have very low risk of intrinsic PEEP because they have very high recoil pressure. Uh, this is during volume control, you see the uh, square flow. This is pressure controlled with a decelerating flow, so inspiration, expiration. And this is a situation where we have increased the inspiratory time, what was called inverse ratio ventilation. And if you increase the inspiratory time, of course, you shorten the expiratory time. And what you see here is that the expiratory time is not sufficient to let the flow return to zero at the end of expiration. And as you probably all know, this is one of the best signs to detect on the ventilator that the patient has intrinsic PEEP. And when these modes of ventilation were initially proposed, people were not aware of this issue of intrinsic PEEP and they found that it was fantastic because with inverse ratio ventilation, PO2 was going up. And this was simply because it was a way to generate PEEP inside the patient. And intrinsic PEEP or external PEEP has mainly the, main, the same effects. But there is a second reason why you can have uh, intrinsic PEEP is uh, collapse of the small airway generating flow limitation. And this happens mainly when you have, uh, for instance, uh, it's, it's very frequent in COPD patient, you know, the, the, the flow limitation. But every time the, the pressure around the small airway is higher than the pressure inside, there is a risk of flow limitation. And uh, it has been described in many disease like COPD, but also like uh, cardio cardiogenic pulmonary edema and even in ARDS, probably because of the weight of the lung. And this impedes the flow to have uh, an exponential decay. So it creates a very particular pattern of flow shape where the flow is interrupted, like if, like if it was completely limited. And this is an example, for instance, of a patient with this typical pattern. You see an initial high 
expiratory peak flow because this is the coming from the large airway which are not collapsed and then you see that uh, instead of an exponential decay you have an almost flat expiratory flow uh, and you see that the next inspiration starts before the flow had time to go uh, to, to reach the zero so even here if you see that the airway pressure is zero absolutely zero remember it's not measured in the alveoli it's measured in the ventilator you can be sure that your patient have intrinsic PEEP and the best way to know it is to make an occlusion an occlusion makes the flow go to zero and look at this uh, striking example despite the fact that we had really zero pressure here in fact inside the patient there was 15 centimeters of water of PEEP which explain all the hemodynamic problems of this patient so for you setting the ventilator this is a very important information five if we now switch to partial ventilatory support which is the most frequent way to ventilate a patient in the ICU you have to know that all the uh, situation between total support where there is no muscular activity and spontaneous ventilation where where the ventilator is not doing anything all these situations are possible whatever the ventilator is support even if you say it's a triggered assist control or triggered assist pressure control or pressure support ventilation it's very difficult to know what is the amount of pressure given by the ventilator and what is the amount of pressure generated by the patient and these are two patients for instance where you have the flow the airway pressure this is what you see on the ventilator and this is the pressure generated by the patient you see despite a very positive airway pressure that you see on the screen you may have a substantial amount of pressure generated by the ventilator why is it important for two reasons the first one is that the total amount of pressure distending the lung is the sum of what you give on the ventilator but what the patient is generating on the other side so you remember when it's passive ventilation it's easy because it's only the ventilator but when it's a form of partial support much more difficult to know and that's important because if you think that your patients for instance still need protective ventilation protective ventilation mean you you want to limit tidal volume and the distending pressure it's not because you use a low pressure on the ventilator that you're protecting the, the patient the lung this is a very nice example where the patient was under pressure support ventilation and at the end of inspiration there was an occlusion like a plateau pressure it's not always easy to do but in this patient it was possible you see there was a good plateau and in this patient with a low level of pressure support the real plateau pressure indicating the total distending pressure was here much higher than the pressure you set on the ventilator so the message here is that uh, it's not because you give a limited amount of pressure that you really protect the lung if the patient is actively breathing the next point is uh, how can I titrate the dose of ventilatory support I have to give to my patient for instance the dose of volume the dose of pressure whatever the mode well you have to be between two extreme one is uh, insufficient support where the patient of course is developing respiratory distress and the other one is uh, 
excessive support where you generate all these problems like ventilator-induced lung injury and ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction. Uh, we know for sure that uh, diaphragm atrophy can occur rapidly in patients under controlled mechanical ventilation. And we have a couple of studies like this one uh, comparing the size of the diaphragm with the uh, uh, biopsy of the diaphragm after a few hours of mechanical ventilation, it completely confirms what was shown previously in animal studies that in a few hours, if the diaphragm is completely passive, uh, there, is, there is atrophy. On the other hand, if you put a patient under, so the other extreme, under partial support, it is sometimes difficult to be sure that you assist the patient correctly. Uh, this was measurements done during assist control ventilation. The patients were triggering <laughs> assist control. Uh, this was measurement of work of breathing. And you see that in half of the patients, or maybe a little bit more, the work of breathing was normal. But in the rest of the patients, despite using assist control ventilation, the work of the breathing of the patient remained higher than normal. So you could say, okay, I should try to give as much support as possible to reduce the work of breathing. Unfortunately, that's not so simple because it was shown that, for instance, if you also use high level of pressure support, you could say, well, pressure support is ideal because the patient is always working. Well, high level of pressure support can be too high. And in this uh, animal study, it was shown that high level of pressure support can also produce diaphragm atrophy. So that's really your role of clinician to titrate between excessive support and insufficient support. With assist control ventilation, you can be used, uh, helped by the curves and knowing the importance of the peak flow setting. This is an example of a curve of passive ventilation. This is an example of a triggered breast. The same breast, but you see with activation of the respiratory muscle, triggered by the patient. And you see there is negative swing in the esophageal pressure. If you superimpose the two curves, the passive one and the one triggered by the patient, uh, the difference is in fact the work of breathing done by the patient. So what I'd like to stress here is that just by looking at the curves, when you see this irregular shape, uh, a change in the peak pressure from breast to breast, you know that probably the patient is working too hard. So you need to reset the ventilator or give sedation. But what is probably the most important during assist control ventilation is the peak flow setting which I mentioned at the very beginning. This is an old study, but just to show that it used the same methodology, superimposing the triggered breast and the assisted breast, uh, the fully assisted breast. And this study, I go very quickly, showed that the lower the peak flow, the higher was the work of breathing of the patient. And from these studies and other studies, it is now recommended that the standard peak flow should be around 60 liters per minute, which is one liter per second. And if you do simple calculation, you will see that with the I to E ratio, it's very easy to get a very low peak flow, for instance. And then you don't understand why your patient is so uncomfortable it's because the flow at which the volume is delivered is too low compared to the needs of the patient. So the patient is, is pulling very hard to get more flow. Pressure support ventilation. It's a very nice way to ventilate patients because they keep a lot of freedom. And if you increase pressure support, usually you reduce work of breathing, you reduce oxygen consumption, so it looks very good. However, 
it is important to know that there is one big problem with pressure support. The problem is that if you increase pressure support, you will not only increase the pressure given to the patient, but also usually you will increase the duration of the insufflation. And for instance, this study looked at the difference between the end of patient's inspiratory effort, this is a diaphragm, and the, the difference between the, the, the peak uh, of the diaphragm and the end of the inspiration. And the higher the pressure support, the larger is this difference. In other terms, if you put a large, a high pressure support, patients will make brief effort and the larger part of the insufflation will be after the end of patient's own inspiration. And this is the main reason why a very, very frequent problem with pressure support is this problem of ineffective efforts, which is illustrated here. You see the airway pressure, pressure support breath, and you see that the patient here is doing an effort which is not triggering the ventilator. And it's not triggering not because the triggering is not sensitive enough, it's because most of the insufflation here happened during the expiratory time of the patient. So in fact, when he, the patient's brain uh, felt that it was time to take the next inspiration, there was a, still a lot of volume to expire in the lungs. So this is creating intrinsic PIP, and this is the main, uh, the main reason why many patients with pressure support, not only COPD, but many patients develop this kind of ineffective efforts, which prolong the time on the venti ventilator. And my last point, and I have finished, is that for any modes of ventilation, like pressure support, but also assist control, uh, the mechanical aspect is important for the comfort and work of breathing, but the oxygenation is also important. And there are uh, a couple of very good studies like this one, showing that for a patient with pressure support ventilation, if you change the FiO2, not making the patient very hypoxemic, but just going from uh, 90 of PO2 to 60, you may, at least in some patients, markedly increase the respiratory rate, the occlusion pressure, which is an indicator of the drive of the patient, and also the dyspnea of the patient. So think when you are in partial ventilatory support that oxygenation also matters a lot for the comfort of the patient. So the summary, the 10 essentials, be aware of the relationship between volume, time and flow. Second, have an idea of the equation of motion. Three, understand what are resistance and compliance. Four, be aware of the issue of intrinsic PIP. Five, know that partial supports m mean any combination of airway pressure and muscular pressure. Six, remember that uh, our main job is to really titrate the dose of support. <laughs> Seven, look at the curves during assist control. Eight, be very careful with the peak flow setting. Nine, know that pressure support can be very easily set too high. And 10, think to oxygenation during partial support. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Uh,